Okay, welcome back for the second half of session five. And for the second half, what we're going to do is keep on working on this whole notion of the expanding spiral and kind of add a little bit more to it. And then just start looking at surfaces and pulling in surfaces and how we, we panelize them. So we'll do a little bit more with the spiral. There's, there's a lot we can do with the spiral, but I want to start, start getting into the surface stuff so that you have a little bit of more information to uh, work with so you can start thinking about our first project that you're going to be completing. But in terms of where we left off, we had gone through and defined just over in Dynamo kind of this basic mathematical construct that would let us um, indicate a number of loops, sort of compute some sines and cosines to place some points, and then just a very, very distance away from the origin, as well as the height above the origin, to give us a sort of expanding helix and in general, we're creating something that looks approximately like the shape of something like a like Guggenheim. Again, there you can kind of see it hanging around in the Revit. Again, we were talking about how with the curves, especially as you start making curves at a lot of points, um, what the number of points versus the curviness that you're trying to achieve is kind of important in that. Like if you have something that has a lot of twisting like this does, you need a number of points for it to create a nice smooth curve. If you have too few points, it'll do its best, but it still could come up with something even though you and your mind know it's a round, smooth spiral, still looks a little bit bumpy around the edges. So that's where we sort of step left uh, the first half of the class. In terms of where we wanted to go next, let me go ahead and just open up instead of this, we'll have to talk about what we want to do. I want to take this notion of this curve here and say, hey, could we use this curve to actually go through and create some vertical surfaces, something like the surface walls? in that museum. And to do something like that, we really got to do something that um, just involves a couple different curves. Having a single curve is great. All the points that we place along this curve, these are definition points. We could put some placement points along this curve and put circles or spheres or whatever we wanted to. But if what we want to do is actually start to create a wall surface, a really good way of creating a wall surface like this that involves a little bit of like uh, unusual geometry is to do something called lofting. Okay, and lofting is something you may be familiar with if you kind of play around in a lot of 3D modeling tools. Let me just kind of give you a real quick sort of demonstration of what lofting does. For example, if I'm hanging around over here in Revit and I say I want to create a new mass, again, don't have to worry about doing this, I'm just doing this to demonstrate it to you. What I can do is create some sort of surface. It's kind of an unusual curve right there. Okay. And if I come up and I create another curve, okay, those two curves could actually be used to create a surface. And what you do is you choose one curve and then the other curve, and you say create a form what happens is Revit then does something, it does a loft. It creates just sort of a connection between those two different curves. And that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to do that mathematically though. We have one curve, which is the base of the walls. We're going to create another curve, which is just the top of the walls, connect them together into a loft. And then it'll go through and create something that can be used to create a wall surface. So let's go back out and show you where that exists or how we can do that. If you want to open up an example to follow, go to it's let's go to 3A. So let's go to uh, session 5, 5.2, and then 3A. You'll see I have some other stuff kind of hanging around in her here. In five point in session in uh, part two of the example, which we'll skip for right now. We just show um, connecting some adaptive components between points along that curve. But that's sort of similar to what we were doing in the little uh, uh, practice example. If we start over here and let's kind of zoom on out here. Let me zoom out here. Start with where we were. Where we were was just up here in the corner, where we defined again the x and y's. We sort of scaled 
them up in terms of the radius, we scaled up the height. If I want to go through and have a second line, a second line which is going to indicate the top of the wall, if I would like that wall, as an example, to be directly above, the top of the wall to be directly above the lower part of the wall, so we have vertical walls, what I can do is just think about how I could generate another curve that would go through and basically follow the same location, but just be a little bit higher. Okay, so let's think about this. If I run this, go ahead and create that curve. There's my one spiral. If I want to create a second spiral, what I need to do is, if you can think about it that the x and y's are essentially going to be the same. It's going to be just vertically right on top of it. Those are going to stay the same. What I want to do is basically take the z values and for every z value that's a lower level, have something that's displaced a certain level above it. So I have these two curves, just one on top of each other. That's what this little code at the bottom of this uh, example is doing. What I'm doing down here is, let me zoom on in. I started with this notion of the z values just going from an initial height to a final height and just scaling from 0 to 30, a certain number of points. If I want to have a displacement, okay, I'll just add to that z value. What I can do is just basically have a number, and I'll let it be a slider so I can change it. And what I'm going to do is just take all the z values that I've computed so far and just add the wall height to it just to get a new wall height. So, or a new z value. So what should happen out of this is if my displacement is 10, if my z values go somewhere like this, 0, 3, and so on, these should go 10, 13.3, they're just one on top of the other. And that's all we really want is to have two different sets of z values. That's super. Once I have my two different sets of z values, Okay. I'd like to go ahead and actually use those z values okay, as coordinates. Okay, so I can create a whole separate set of coordinates. So what I'm going to do is pull the same x and y coordinates down into a new point by coordinates, but I'm going to pull my new z values over. What that should do, if you give that a run in the background there, is actually create a whole new set of points that are floating above the existing helix. Okay. Super. So if I got that whole set of points, I took this whole set of points, and I want to create two curves as opposed to a single curve, what I want to do is grab that and put it up here in the NURBS curve. Now, I could do this as a whole separate NURBS curve and kind of do it that way. That would actually work out fine. And by that, I mean that I could say that I'm going to do is NURBS. Uh, where is it? What did I do it by? By control points? Just by points, not by control points. NURBS curve. I'm looking for which one is exactly the same because there's a number of different ones and it has to do with really uh, what oh, whether you're sort of approximating the curve on the outside with control points or you don't want the, to go through the point there by points They'll make it go explicitly through some points. So I could take this through. Okay. And now I have those two curves, one right on top of the other. Okay, and that would work. The other way, though, I showed that you could use is you could take this set of points, that set of points, and create a list out of them and then do the same thing to both elements in the list. Either way, it just kind of works out about the same. It just depends on where you want to combine these things together. So if I wanted to sort of just leverage the fact that I already have some of the 
kind of coding defined. I could take that point, set of points, and this set of points and make a list out of them, and then feed in the list to that nerd skirt. Either way. So it's going to essentially get you very similar things. The difference is now, that's a set of two curves that are coming out of a single node. Before it was like two different nodes and two different curves. The nice thing about bringing them in, though, as nerve curves by points and bringing it in kind of as a collection, a, a series of a, or a, a list that has both those curves in it, is that whatever we do, for example, if we put a lot of placement points on it, it'll apply to both of them automatically. So we're getting that parallelism between everything. Now, I got my two different curves. Here they are kind of hanging around in there. They're not too bad looking. You can again try all sorts of things like, oh, what could we do? I could try, let me make that auto just so you can sort of see it a little bit better. Changing the height of the wall, so I'll lower that down. Again, change the spiral, uh, inner radius, outer radius, change whatever I want. But if you, what you would like to do is actually go through and create some sort of a surface that connects those two by locking the other. Okay, yeah. Okay, If you're set, if your Revit is set to meters, it'll be four meters. If it's set to uh, feet, it'll be feet, like decimal feet. Okay, so we got this, we got that. If I'd like to create a surface, you might remember I lofted a surface. I grabbed two curves in lofting, and there is an equivalent function in the world of Dynamo. If you slide on over in the script, where did I put it? After I have the curves, I put it right over here in my little graph. There's something called surface by loft. And what does surface by loft do? It basically expects that if you feed it a bunch of curves, it'll lock them all together. Okay, so if I go ahead and grab this one curve, all right, so a list of two curves, and I let it run, it'll go through and create a surface. You can sort of see what it created in the background there. It also created it over in Revit. How would you What I would have to do is I'd have to say list create and combine them together and then feed it the list. Because it wants a list. So it's yeah, either list me now or list me later. At some point, I have to get the list together. Okay, so super. With that, you now start having this very flexible little uh, <coughs> ribbon that can do all sorts of different things. So for example, if I change the wall height, if I change the height of just the twist, making it very tall, making it very flat, okay. or if I change the inner and outer radius, for example, if I want it to be a ziggurat and go the other direction, I can have it taper in. I would start at close to zero and taper out. You have all sorts of flexibility. And that's really what the idea behind the parametric design is, is that if we can go through and set up a little bit of map and use that to drive the geometry as opposed to placing it explicitly, we now have something incredibly flexible for being able to explore a lot of different design options without having to get all the way to a specific set of dimensions that are you know, so hard to build the Revit objects out of that you're very hesitant to sort of explore the shape. Because we'd like to go ahead and explore that. Maybe I want to explore just what the radius growth is so I can have a self-shading building and make sure that the upper level is always shading the lower levels. You know, there's all these different things that we can test and dynamically uh, go through and uh, just sort of see what the results would be of changing just a few parameters. Okay. We'll, we'll leave this example for now. There's really a lot you can do with this example. If you want to again, keep on playing with the whole Guggenheim thing, we can create another curve for the inner side of the ramp and sort of have a floor that connects those two things together to be the ramp surface. And then either have it follow a constant radius for the wall or taper it in, kind of like it actually does in the Guggenheim. 
you can really get an awful lot of the geometry just out of a few sliders, stuff like that. And that's really the idea behind all things. Like, can you, you know, ultimately do that and cast these into real wall surfaces? Okay. Enough of that one. Let's talk about surfaces. Surfaces are sort of the next thing we really want to deal with. And surfaces are these guys. It's not just these individual sticks or skeletal pieces or bones that we're connecting together. It's surfaces in a lot of our world is surfaces. So we want to know a couple of different things about surfaces. We'd like to sort of figure out, A, how we divide them up if we need to sort of support them. But B, we'd like to sort of figure out oh, how we can analyze them, how we can sort of apply things to them. And that's where this gets sort of really interesting. So let me go close that up. We'll talk about just surfaces and how we divide them. So we're going to start with an example that's going to take a simple surface and we're just going to divide it up. And then really, in terms of the script for what we're doing, it's going to look something like this. We're going to start by selecting something. That's pretty much where we always start. We're going to select something from the Revit model. Then we're going to do some computations. We're going to create a grid, something called a UV grid, that'll have, if you can sort of think about it, any surface just scaling from 0 to 1 in two different directions. We, call it, we don't call it XY, we call it UV, because it's going to map to whatever the shape of the surface is. But it's going to scale to 0 to 1 in those two different directions, kind of mapping to that. And then for that grid mapped to that surface, we're going to go through and compute some x, y, z points. So we'll start by creating sort of just a simple grid that goes 0 to 1 in two directions. Then we'll use a function called surface point at parameter, where we give it the u and v values, and then go through and give us a whole list of points. So as soon as we have points all over the surface, we get a couple of different things. We could go ahead and grab groups of points and put them in clumps that would allow us to put like ribs or trusses or some sort of support elements, themes on them. The other thing we're going to learn how to do though is actually go ahead and put panels on top of it. But it all starts with the same just UV grids. So the first example dividing a surface, we'll just take a surface, we'll break it, we'll go through and group them into groups of like a placement for some beams, and we'll place some beams. Okay, and panels look very similar. So I'll start with 5.3. If you can, go ahead and open up 5.3. See what I got out here. You'll see 5.3 is just a surface, kind of an arbitrary, just kind of shell shape. Let it finish opening here. Pull it in. It's thinking, it's thinking. Excellent. Now, this surface that I have in here is actually a mass. What I can do just to sort of make it a little bit easier to see what's going on, if you want to, do visibility graphics. We're going to make that mass sort of transparent. That'll actually help us just see through and see both the mass and the elements that are supporting it. So for under mass, you can actually turn transparency on if you like. That just sort of lets us see through the mass. Okay, so you can still sort of get a sense of where the surface is, but you also sort of see, right now I have a whole bunch of different, like, uh, beams supporting that. So you can see these are three-point beams, little three-point adaptive beams. So what I'm going to do is grab my surface, I'm going to divide it up so that I have three points to work with, and then place a bunch of beams along those three different points. And the number of beams that would be something we can choose, whether I want to put five in there, whether I want to put 10 in there, whatever it is I want to put in there. Okay, the idea is though, if that surface changes, the beams will adapt to it so that, you know, if someone's designing a very nice, arbitrary, organic surface that looks really cool, you could always place the beams underneath it. Okay, 
So to play with this, go to a nearby add-ins. Let's go ahead and open up the script and let's start with 5.3a. This doesn't look too bad. Not too many nodes hanging around in here. Let's take a look. Again, it's going to start by selecting a face. We always kind of end up selecting something first, or almost always. You'll see it's going to start by selecting a face. Then I'm going to define a little grid. It looks like it's going to be 8 by 3 in my world. In my world, I went with 3 as the B direction because I have three point trusses that I want to put on there. So I need to get three points in that direction. Eight is going to be the number of ribs, or the number of beams that gets placed across it in the other direction. Okay. So let's start by just selecting the face. Go ahead and just do change, see if you can go out there into Revit and grab the face. It may already be set up, so it's doing it. But we'll just make sure we have it. Okay, now you are old pros at code blocks now, so let's talk about what's going to happen with this code block. I'll turn that automatically. Okay, I have 0 to 1 with 8 points. I have 0 to 1 with 3 points. So I have two different kind of ranges right there. That's the 3.1. Actually, with code blocks, the hard part is when you sort of just say preview, it it only shows you the last thing. So if you really want to sort of see what's going on with both of those different series, what you got to use is that watch. Watch is another popular one. If you want to, you can watch that zero to one. Okay. And now you'll see if I change the number of beams that I want there in this slider. You'll see I'll just get a smaller number over there. Okay, the other one should stay fairly constant, or should stay constant because it doesn't have a slider on it. Okay, now let's talk about this UV grid. This is where it gets a little bit confusing. It's basically going to range from 0 to 1 in one direction, 0 to 1 in the other direction. Okay? And where U is and where V is, is always sort of, it's sort of relative to how you defined it in terms of which direction. Okay. It's relative to how you define the surface, which direction is going to be considered U and which is considered V. For my case, yeah, I know in this example, oh, the V is going to go this way and the U is heading this way. But basically, it starts from 0, 0, and then it just goes to 1 over here, 0. 0.5 is in the center, 0. 0.25 would be here. But if you can picture a grid just shrink wrapping itself to the surface, that's what's going on. Yeah. What's nice about a UV grid is that it's perfectly regular in that if you say go to the 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5 point, it'll take you right to the middle of the surface in both directions. The 0, 0 point, the 1, 1 point, so it's really just kind of a nice mathematical abstraction that lets you, regardless of the shape of the surface, it always gives you a constant way of thinking about it. Okay, so it just gives you a relative position. Super. So we're going to take that UV sort of notion, and what we're going to do is with that surface and these guys here, this notion of what the grid is like, pull it together and actually get one of the true x, y, z points. And that's what surface point at parameter does. Surface point at parameter lets you take a surface, lets you take some sort of u's and v's. You can give it a single uv pair. You can give it a whole grid of uv pairs. And if I give it two different lists and say, let's do a cross product, then it will evaluate it on a whole grid. A little u a little v. And let's take a look what it gives you. So what it's giving me is actually a whole grid of points back. 
Okay, so here's the way the points basically work. It's an overall list, and then within the overall list, there's these sublists where every different, what I'll call either a row or a column, is sort of grouped too. So you see within here, within the overall list of all the different points in the grid, these are the first three points, that's the second three points, the third three points. That's basically, if we were marching across the surface, it's basically giving me here. That's one grid. This one, that one, that one. That's the second list. This one, this one, that one. That's the third list. So it's basically breaking them like that. It's going through and imposing a sort of very regular structure to the whole thing. Okay. So let's check in. How are we doing in terms of, do we got points? If you got lots of points, we are ready to group those points. So here's what we're going to do. These points are actually in pretty good shape. We have basically all these little subgroups, okay? But what's happening is they're enclosed in this bigger list, okay? So the very first thing we're going to do in terms of being able to work with it is we would like to have those groups of three points, but we don't want those three points in part of a bigger list. We actually just want little groups of three points where it's groups of three points not uh, unclosed as part of a larger like, construct of the whole list. So what we have to do is just flatten it. Okay? By flattening at one level, what we'll do is we have these three different points, okay, which are like the rows within the bigger list, and if we flatten it by one level, you'll see what's going to happen is we'll just get groups of three points. Again, the way to think about it is almost as though you're outdenting. You're just outdenting the list, kind of pushing it to the left. So if I take those points, pull it on over, and I flatten it by one, you get that. Can you see the very subtle distinction? It's still groups of three points. It's just they're not constructed as part of this outer list. Okay, and that's what flattening this. Okay. We just need to, so we don't want the group of all groups of three points. We just need groups of three points. Okay. It's flattening out like this. And once we have those, we can use these points to actually place this adaptive beam, this little three-point adaptive beam. So from here on out, it's actually very straightforward. What you got to do is just take these groups of three. If the adaptive beam wants groups of three, just take that on over, and then it'll place the adaptive beam. How do you know if it wants groups of three? Okay, the only way to know that, and that's a very good question, is back in the adaptive component itself, just select it, and it'll show you how many it wants. Let's see if it finishes placing here. If you go back to the Revit file and you choose one of the beams, you'll see it'll like, uh, oops, it's still placing. I get an error. You get, well, let's take a look. Okay, so here, here is the component. You can see here it has one, two, three, or you can edit the family. It'll tell us that two. If we get an error, it almost always is somehow related to just the hierarchy of things. So let's just kind of check in everyone. Well, Andrew, you doing good? Excellent. Okay, doing good, doing good. Excellent. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, and that's just because the family, let's change it to the adaptive beam. Oh, it would be adaptive beam. You just changed that. No worries, weird. No. No worries. Because we're just looking at for the family type, how many points, and you're just trying to do the mapping. Beautiful. Okay, now let's go ahead and just look at this at a high level. Because what we're going to do next is just a very minor extension of this. For the most part, this whole notion of selecting a surface, applying a UV grid, and somehow grabbing points, how's that resonating with you? Does it sort of feel okay? 
this. We're going to do something very similar to that. We're going to go ahead and continue to apply UV points. That we always end up doing. But it really comes down to how we group the points that we get out of the UV grid. If we sort of group them in rows or columns, we tend to get like things that can be used to place adaptive components like beams or trusses or something like that. But where we're going to go next, which is actually kind of cool, is how to place panels. And let's talk about that. Panels are a little bit interesting. By panels, what I want to do is have something that is placed that does this. It goes here, here, like that's a panel. That's a panel. That one's a panel. Okay. So as we go through and we try to think about panels, and most panels are placed by four points, okay, we have to do sort of a little interesting math on this because unlike just going through and trying to connect three lines or three over here or some number there, panels are a little strange. What you actually want to do is form a quad Okay, think about how you do that mathematically. It's really kind of interesting. If you're at the, what, the second row at the first point, you want to go over and get the second row second point, but you also want to go to the third row first point and the third row second point. It's a little bit of strange math to go through and do that. Okay. Fortunately, that's been thought of. So there are actually functions that help you do that. So if you give it a rectangular grid of points, you'll get there's functions that'll let return a quad of points, or return all the quads of points, which are very, very useful for panelizing. Okay, so that's the only real kind of variation or kind of uh, change that's happening as we move into the next example. So we divided a surface, that part's good. After we divide the surface, we're gonna do the same thing. If I can get to that. doing. Who has my mouse? Once we divide the surface, the next step is really just adding panels to the surface. And in terms of adding panels to the surface, it's really very similar. We are again going to select that face. It always starts with selecting the face. We're going to divide the grids. Okay. In this case, I'm talking about doing two different grids. One for putting beams on, and the other one for doing panels. We'll just focus on the panels for right now, but we're going to map the UV grids to the surface. Okay. We'll ignore the beams. That was like what we did just last night. But we're going to break the panel list of surface points into quads. And then, based on the quads, we're going to place these adaptive panel components, which are four points, as opposed to like a three. So let's go ahead and like uh, take a look at that. To get going, go ahead and open up if you can. Five point four. And once again, I have a perfectly uh, generic looking surface there. Okay, if I want to divide this up, what we're going to do is very similar again. We're going to again sort it or uh, select it. Let me open the dynamo script or graph. We're going to select it. We're going to sort of choose some UV spacing to the whole thing and then go ahead and grab some points. Okay, 5.4, go to 1A, okay, at some level it's going to start by selecting the face again, so just go ahead and choose that face. Next up, we're just going to go through and 
put some p placement points on there. I'm going to follow the upper track. We'll leave the lower one alone for right now. That's putting beans on there. That's actually just what we did in the last example. So we'll say we'll up here. If I want to go through and put here a number of different panel points, let's think about this. Okay. If I put the base in here, super, and I go through and I compute a grid going 0 to 1, and I say surface point of parameter. Let's kind of hook that together and see what it looks like. If I say 6, 0 to 1, and just do my little watch here. If I grab that and I say that I want six points, you'll see that I have here, one, two, three, four, five. I got six points there. Okay. If I have six placement points, how many panels do I have? Six. We have zero, zero to six, right? Or oh, actually, that's correct. Right. In the second one, in the B direction, I'm going to have six. Okay. In the other one, I'm going to have five. And that's, you're on to the essence of kind of the thing you have to watch out for here is you always have one less panel than you have placement points. And that's just kind of like this, the simple math. You have the dividing lines and then you have the panels between them. So we are going to take those U's and I'm going to take those V's. I'm going to take that surface and I get them all together. And what I should get is just like we had last time when it runs. We're going to get a grid of points. So you'll see I have a collection here of, what is it? It's six different rows. And in each different row, I have seven different panels going across. Seven different points going across. So yeah, the grid basically set up now. We are now ready to actually go through and do something interesting. You can see, if you go back over to Revit in the background, we have all those points kind of hanging around. They're looking pretty good. But again, what I want to do is not just sort of grab a simple row of them. Okay. I actually want to create quads out of them. And that's where it gets sort of interesting. Okay. The logic for putting quads in there is something that, again, has been thought of because a lot of people do it. It's a very common operation. However, it's not built in as a standard function. So on your script right now, if you see quads from rectangular grid over here, it's probably sitting there in red. Is it sitting there in red? Yeah. Not to worry. We're going to show you how to fix that. There are a whole number of custom components out there, custom nodes that people put in there that you want to be able to take advantage of. And when you need to find one of them, then what you do is you go to the Packages menu and say Search for a Package. Because there's all sorts of uh, like the big open source exchange of all these different nodes, and we'll put our own nodes out there. In fact, you'll find things out here that from previous versions of the class that people have put out there. But if you type in quads, or let's say, uh, let's see if I can find quads from rectangular. There's quads from rectangular grid right there. Let's see if you can find that one. If you can, this is by someone named Zach Cron, who is like the godfather of all things uh, Dynamo. You know, part of the team who uh, does an incredible job of developing good stuff for us to work with. Click on that little arrow right there. It'll download it and install it in your machine. Are you sure you want to put it in there and say OK? I already have it in there. But it should put it in there for you. When it puts it in there, over in your browser, you should now have something called Build Z, which is like a Zach. 
kind of site for uh, all the stuff that he puts together. And under there, that quads from rectangular grid should be actually one of the functions that's available. So see if you have that available. You got it? If you do, then this node should probably no longer be red. Excellent. Okay, that's what you want. So if ever you see these red custom nodes, that's what's going on. We'll learn about how you edit these custom nodes. If I say edit this custom node, don't worry about doing it right now. But if you edit it, you'll see there's actually a whole bunch of logic underneath this. And this is the logic that Zach very nicely went through and did for you about how to create those quads so you don't have to. Okay. What you're going to do is basically take those surface points and pull them over to that quads. Now, there's a very slight variation you have to sort of play with in this whole thing. And this is going to get to that whole thing that we keep on running into. This list over here, which is hanging around right here, it has the individual points. It has the grouped into sort of rows. But it also has an outer list, which is sort of odd. It's a list of lists. And so what we need to do is just flatten it out. So I'll flatten it down one level. And then I'll say points from the list. Okay. And we run this. You'll see it returns groups of four points. And groups of four points are really what we're after because if we have a bunch of four point panels that we want to put in there, we want groups of four points. We are so close to home free right now because we have groups of four points. And say so every group of four points within a list. Okay? So we're very close to being able to say, take these points and just put them in there and place adaptive components by them. But of course, it would only be too simple if it worked that way. You'll notice that this list is encompassed or is encapsulated in a list, so we have to flatten it out again. And then if you take that flattened list, which again, doesn't look very different. It really just only has that outer list missing. And we take those points in, and I tell it to use the aperture panel. You should get something that looks pretty groovy. Back in the background in terms of Applying all those towels, notice they're bending, twisting, contorting, whatever needs to happen. This is a fairly regular shape, but this is an incredibly curvaceous shape that would match that. You can change the parameters, the x and y parameters, and just kind of do whatever you want to do. You kind of really make it as fine or as broad. As you make the panels closer and closer together, the follow the curve even better, but it's also going to be a little you know, more computationally intensive. There's more of them. So we play a whole game of trying to figure out how to optimize the size of the panel relative to the degree of curvature and stuff like that. But we'll keep on going with this. We'll think about how we start taking those panels and adjusting them to respond to color, to respond to sun conditions, all sorts of different things. But it all starts with the panel idea. Okay. Let me, as you are leaving today, just plant a seed for where we're going to go next. And that is, I'll write it up and kind of post it tonight. This is sort of your assignment, your first design project in this class. Because we throw out these little practice things, and they're kind of cool just for kind of getting your feet wet and sort of understanding things. Your first assignment really is going to be to design some simple little structure. Okay? And within that structure, to go through and basically define a little bit of math that will sort of indicate, like, you know, its bounds. It's really, but then within those bounds that you define, just go ahead and place some adaptive components to. Uh, just kind of form its shape. So whether it's trusses or beams, things like that little bridge structure, or even surfaces on it, okay, you're going to start thinking ahead to like some little thing you can design. So things to think about that I think are appropriate scale that you can kind of take a look at. Things like, oh, it's the bandstand in your local park, I think has a good size to it. Um, a bus stop is kind of an interesting thing to think about. There's some really cool bus stops in San Francisco at the Muni stations that actually have really cur curvy, uh, interesting sine wavy sort of tops to it. But it's really, you want something that's, oh, you know, it's 20 to 30 feet wide. It's only a single story tall. Nothing too awfully exotic here. But what you want to do is have something where 
Think about something where with a little bit of action with some sliders, okay, you can start deforming and recreating it so that it adapts itself you know, based on different people's user preferences. So it's a design that can dynamically reshape itself you know, based upon some high level parameters. Okay, but again, I'll send something out with a formal write-up and stuff like that. Just think it in your own head about some little structure, you know, it could be a magazine stand, it could be it's some little something. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll be next. So kind of just figure out what it is you want to do. If you and as you as you start with this whole thing, if you have questions, just holler. Keep it keep the scale small and interesting. It's really it's not that you're going to create an incredibly fantastic structure, it's just that you start to think about how structures can start responding to these parameters that you've got to push and pull, stuff like that. Okay? Cool. So I'll send you right up on like exactly what we have in mind tonight. Okay. Let us adjourn for today then.